Hey guys, you all seem very excited to be here, which is very nice. How is April Fool's Day treating you so far? Hello. Who is even here? I can see Fatima, I can see Adam. I can't see, that's a bit of a lie. Mamina, how are we doing? You all right? You're being very quiet. Hey, there you go. Hey, Kang. Hey, Freya. Hey, Anand. Hey, Oase. Happy April Fool's Day. Have any of you guys been fooled by anyone yet? Any good stories? Hi from Kenya. That's cool. I don't think I've ever been in Kenya before. This is new for me. Hello. No? Yeah, I haven't heard anything. You normally get, like, fairly good things in the news. Like, you get, like... um. I don't know, some funny story. I haven't seen that to any today, I think. <laughs> Fooled by your your teacher's amount of work. How much work are they setting you, Natalie? I'm genuinely intrigued because I know quite a lot of my old colleagues work in a school and I've got a rough idea of how much work they're setting, but not really anyone else. But it's true, there is no one to fool. Hi from Mauritius. Oh, nice. Oh, I feel very popular right now. Thank you. <laughs> a lot. How much is a lot? Three lessons per lesson. Just a regular amount. Yeah, I assumed that you'd be getting like an hour or so, like from each subject. And I guess in A-level, you only have like three subjects a day or four. Like, can't be that bad. You're getting quite a lot. How are you finding it? How are you finding like working from home and being a bit more independent? That must, that must be really strange. Like, I imagine most of you are going to go to university next year. So this is probably what you're going to be doing mostly next year. Hi from South Africa. Nice. Yeah. Do you feel like it's quite nice to sort of be in control of when you do it and like how much time you spend on that topic and how much time you spend on that topic and whatnot? Okay, you get an online class. That's cool. Beautiful weather in South Africa. Um, nice to learn, but getting certain more work. You're motivated. Oh, you're less motivated. Oh, no. I'll do immunology at some point. Don't you worry. Uganda. Damn. Never been to Uganda either. Um, <laughs> hey from Malta, Pakistan. <laughs> nice. Okay, fine. I guess I guess what you got? Yes, UK. I'm glad someone from the UK is here. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna go through pretty much everything um, that the A level spec goes through, really. So I'm planning on starting in year twelve, just because that seems like a logical place to start, right? And just go from there. Um, but anyway, let's let's do some work. Okay, let's actually do some stuff as opposed to just chatting, which I can fairly happily do pretty much all day. Um, so we're going to look at um, enzymes. <laughs> it's an interesting country. I imagine it is. Um, so yeah, enzymes. So we did some protein stuff. Let's just carry on sort of down that road. Eh? So for those of you that are interested, I'll talk about this more at the end, but I obviously work for a company who are Stamp Provise, and we don't just do YouTube sessions. We do a whole load of things. Um, I'm going to be teaching about three hours a day, um, pretty much on our, on our platform. So if you are at all interested in having more biology lessons, then stick around for a coupon code at the end. If you don't want to, then feel free not to. But anyway, um, so having a look at this then, we're going to sort of look at the inhibitors and the other things that affect enzyme rates. So which statements about the effect of all enzyme inhibitors are correct? So obviously, if we're looking at, oh, what are the two different types of enzyme inhibitors? <laughs> The code is always £10 off. Zara, it's like you're complaining about that. What even is an inhibitor, firstly? Okay, cool, cool, cool. So I'm just checking that we know what we're on about. So competitive and non-competitive. What do competitive do? What do non-competitive do? Competitive. So what actually is the difference, sorry? I want everyone to agree on this. So what, what's, what do these things do? So yes, that is what an enzyme does. Uh, inhibitors actually aren't on a couple of the specs. I think it's not on the edit. It's, there's at least one spec where um, inhibitors aren't on it. So I apologize if you haven't seen this before. Okay, so enzymes have a shape that look a bit like Pac-Man, as lots of you will know. Competitive, thank you, Fasma are the ones that will bind to the active site. So this is a competitive inhibitor. Whereas a non-competitive inhibitor binds away from the active site, sometimes called the allosteric site. So just away. 
And essentially the non-competitive ones cause them to denature so they don't work. Whereas the competitive ones just bind uh, reversibly for a little, for a short amount of time. So um, change the shape of the active sites. Um, because it's asking about all of them, that is uh, not true. Denature the enzyme, um, because it's talking about all of them, only non-competitives do that. Only uh, non-competitives do the first one as well. So the, actual only, the only one that it is, is they both reduce the rate of enzyme catalyzed reactions. So the right answer is D. So if you said that, well done. Okay, so not all of them do one and two, but every single one of them does reduce the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. And I'm gonna be showing you a few graphs in a bit where we can actually have a look at that um, from like an experimental sort of point of view. Cool, good start. There you go, didn't lie, did I? Um, so the graph show the rate of reaction of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. The graph shows the effect of increasing the concentration of the substrate at two different concentrations of a competitive inhibitor. So the black line, that's dumb. The sort of straight line is no inhibitor. Um, this one is a low concentration, this one is a high concentration. So which graphs, I don't know if my face is in the way for any of you, um, which graphs show the effect of increasing the concentration of substrate at two different concentrations of competitive inhibitor? What do you guys reckon? So, sorry, a competitive inhibitor then. Um, here's your enzyme. It will literally go and stick to where the substrate tends to bind and it will just reduce the likelihood of uh, certain things happening, which I'm not gonna give away because that's even the next question. Um, so it just sort of reduces the, well, it's one of the questions. It reduces the chances of a substrate being able to fit in. So because it's already blocked, it means that a substrate is less likely to come along and bind, which is gonna do something. Okay, so some of you are saying B. So we're between this one, some of you have said A as well, and that one. One person has said C, <laughs> one person has said D. Okay, so um, if I've got this competitive inhibitor, something that can stick into the active site of my enzyme, the thing with competitive inhibitors is they only bind temporarily. So my competitive inhibitor might come and bind for a few minutes and then after that it might leave and it might sort of go elsewhere, right? So after enough time, it might have wandered off, um, floated off, by which time um, and the substrate can come and sit inside of my active site. So say the substrate looks something like that where it can fit inside. Um, what this means is that ultimately I will eventually get to the same stage. So ultimately, um, the rate of reaction will still get as high as it physically can. It's just going to take a little bit longer. Reversible means it can, um, I don't know, it's like when you melt some, water, uh, some ice, right? You can refreeze it. But anyway, what this means is the rate of reaction will ultimately get to the same position, okay? Because it's because of the reversible nature of it, it will eventually get to the same position. And essentially that is only happening in one of these graphs. So the only one that's happening is this one. The only one where it ultimately gets to roughly the same point, which is about here, is B. For A and D, this is actually showing you a non-competitive inhibitor because a non-competitive inhibitor will alter the tertiary structure, change the active site and prevent it from working. Okay, for C, it's just not really close enough. Um, and that's about it really, it's just, it's just not quite right. Okay, so it has to be B for this one. Okay. Um, so, an unusual enzyme has been found in a tropical grass. I love that they always have like a nice little, ooh, here's something to really make you, I don't know, think about all the nice possibilities of tropical grass. A uh, person who's just said, so C is non-competitive. Uh, no, C is actually competitive. It's just the shape of it isn't quite right. It wouldn't quite be like that, I wouldn't have said. So C looks like it is competitive. It's just not quite in the right form. If I know C isn't, C, the rate is reduced, isn't it? So C is, C is non-competitive because it's not getting to the same rate. So yeah, sorry, I'm talking nonsense. Uh, yeah, C is also non-competitive. But anyway, so this unusual enzyme has been found in tropical grass. So it catalyzes the hydrolysis of the fungal polysaccharide chitin into amino sugars. So they're already throwing you something which you've never come across before. So who knew that chitin was made of amino sugars? I certainly didn't. 
It also inhibits the activity of an enzyme in the locust gut, which catalyzes the digestion of amylose. Okay, so it's also breaking down some form of sugar. Um, what describes the actions of this unusual enzyme? So I would, for this question, work out what work out which of these four it is first, and it's going to be two of them, and then I'd work out this one on the right-hand side as well. Okay, so what do you guys think? Kang, that is like halfway there. <laughs> Ed is bold though. Louis is also bold. Eleanor is bold. Sujata is bold. It's a weird question, isn't it? <laughs> bold, B-O-L-D. Maybe it's my funny Essex accent, which is confusing you. Okay. Nice one, Ed. I think if it's after 12 o'clock, and unfortunately, I think you are the April Fool, so sorry about that. Right, let's have a look then. So um, it catalyzes the hydrolysis of a, of a um, polysaccharide. What are polysaccharides made of? What is the bond that you get in a polysaccharide? Thomas, I've never even heard of an amino sugar, so I can't tell you. What bond is in a polysaccharide? Good. Right, so hydrolysis of glycosidic bonds is what it tells us it does. So it can't be C or D. So none of those two um, can be the option. The second thing, it inhibits the activity of an enzyme which catalyzes the digestion of amylose. Amylose is made of what? Yep, so it's basically, it's um, starch is made of amylose, isn't it? So it's made of alpha glucose, which also means that it's got glycosidic bonds in it, doesn't it? So we need to work out which one it's inhibiting. So if it is digesting it, what does digestion mean? You are right to say 1,4 alpha glucose. Oh, sorry, you're right to say 1,4 glycosidic bonds, not 1,4 alpha, um, alpha glucose. Good. If it's digesting, it's hydrolysis. So it can't be this one. It can't be condensation. So it's inhibiting um, the hydrolysis of glycolysis uh, of glycosidic bonds. And it's also um, catalyzing the hydrolysis of glycosidic bond. It's just doing it to two different molecules. So yeah, the answer has to be B. Well done if you got that. That is, it's a weird question because they're basically getting and you to work out what polysaccharide means, work out what digestion means, and work out what amylose means. Well done. Okay, cool. Let's look at another one. I feel like these questions, you sort of, you do enough of them, and they eventually all kind of start looking roughly the same. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's just me. Maybe you could have looked at them more than once. Um, yeah, these have all been one mark so far. So they are, they're, I'm going to get some hard ones. Don't you worry, bowl of rice. Um, so the enzyme uh, catechol oxidase, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong, causes a brown colour to develop when um, slices of many fruits are exposed to air. Oh, there you go. That's cool. Who knew that? So the enzyme catechol oxidase is what causes your apples to go brown when you have cut them. How exciting. You didn't choose condensation because it didn't say that it was making bonds. It said it was inhibiting something that was breaking bonds. Uh, the enzyme catalyzes a following reaction. So catechol plus oxygen um, under the enzyme catechol oxidase leads to the production of quinone and water. Quinone is then immediately further oxidized in the air to a brown colored substance. Catechol and quinone are colorless. A student investigated the rate of reaction under different conditions. State how the student could follow the progress of this reaction. Is it given off gas? Do you know that it's given off gas? So reduction in mass, why would we assume that it's reducing in mass? <laughs> Natalie Bates, be a little bit more specific. 
the intensity of the color e- equally Bethan, um Bethan, Bethan, Bethany, Bethan. Be a bit more specific. Colorimeter. Excellent. So oxygen's being used up, but it's taken it from the atmosphere. So there's no way of really measuring that. That'd be really difficult. Uh, so, um, Jacka, you have uh, also another means of getting this, right? So the time taken to turn a particular color of brown, use a colorimeter, use a colorimeter. Um, okay, so what do we do with a colorimeter in order to actually measure stuff? So I know you guys probably don't need to actually mention this too much. Um, but I think it's important anyway, and why not go over it? Oxygen bubbles, no, we are using oxygen, so we're not gonna see any oxygen being made. Yeah, it's taking in gas and producing some water, which would be difficult. So you calibrate it. Yeah, doing centrifuge. Um, I am, if you've said colorometer, you're right. But I, I'm just intrigued if you guys know how to actually use it. So you measure the light absorption, yes. You choose the right color filter, yes. So you choose like some brown color. No centrifuges. Put it in a cuvette. Lovely. Then what? Thank you, Missy. Me. I shaved my beard this morning, I'm trying to make myself look young again. Gosh. That was taken at the start of this year, though. Right. <laughs> Okay, right. So let's just let's just basically give a mark. So state how machine can follow the progress of this reaction. Um, they would use a colorimeter, not to be confused with a calorimeter, which everyone always does. Calorimeter measuring calories, this measuring the color, basically. Uh, essentially what it does, so those of you who said it are right, you have a little cuvette and you put a sample in and essentially it will send a beam of light through, it will hit a detector, and then that detector will tell you um, how much light is either transmitted through or has been absorbed. You are also right to say that you have a little filter in the way. So if you were doing this, state how a student could follow the progress of this reaction, you would need to say use a colorometer, um, taking samples at different times. And then you need to compare it to something. Does anyone know what you compare this to? So you could, you would set it to zero first. You'd use water to blanket. You're right. Um, for this question, it's a bit ambiguous actually. So it looks like they're given a mark just for this word colorimeter, but they also give a mark for something else, which I want you to see if any of you are actually gonna come up with. So what's it called? The standard, it's a something standard. So you use a something standard. You never use an empty cuvette either. You always have to use at least water, not a standard solution. So you compare to, or compare against, color standards, Kang, well done. So you compare to color standards. Does anyone know what I mean by a color standard? <laughs> Jacka, don't just tell me yes, you did the classic, oh, do you have the time? Uh, yes, I do have the time. It, yeah, you do compare it to like a calibration curve. You do have a calibration curve. You are right. Essentially what color standards are, right, is what is the, what's the brown colored thing here? Uh, so basically quinone, it says that that's colorless, but it says that it immediately oxidizes um, to form a brown colored substance, right? So essentially what you do is you'd get different concentrations of quinone, so known concentrations. So maybe I'd get like 10%, uh, 20%, 30%, etc. right? And you have a look at what color it is after it's oxidized, so it's brown. And then let's say that 10% has a, um, I don't know, a transmission of 95%, right? So that's got a 95% transmission. 20%, let's say that it's gone down to like 80% transmission. And 30%, it's gone down to like 60%. Essentially what you do is you'll have a graph where you have um, concentration against um, transmission, percentage transmission, and you can then use that to work out the concentration of your substance. So if I've got concentration down here and transmission, then essentially your graph will look something like this. As a concentration increases, um, the transmission is also is gonna go down. So, 
There you go. So you use a colorimeter, you take samples at different times and you compare to color standards. So if I know that the transmission when I'm doing this experiment is 100%, then I know that my concentration of quinone is gonna be zero. If my transmission is roughly here, then I know that my concentration is going to be roughly there. Okay, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, so it's, this is a way to quantify, right? No, so no, you don't need all of this for one mark. To get your one mark, you just need to say use a colorimeter. That is your mark. But on my mark scheme, it does say um, you can also get a mark for saying, for talking about comparing color standards. And if this was a two mark question, they definitely want you to say something like that. Okay, so a color standard is just a known concentration. Known concentration and, um, I don't know, transmission, which you use as a comparison. So it's a way to quantify something. So instead of me saying, oh yeah, that's, I don't know, that's a bit brown or that's 80% brown, I could say something like, oh, that means that it's got a 20% concentration of quinone in it or something. Okay, so no, for this question, just say use a colorimeter. I'm just being a teacher and trying to explain how it works because I don't know, I'm a nerd. But yeah, I think if this was any more than a one mark question, you'd need to talk about this. Okay, um, right, next question. In the first investigation, the student measured the initial rate of reaction in varying, con in varying concentrations of catechol. So catechol being um, a substrate. Okay. So the student measured the initial rate of reaction in the varying concentrations of catechol. The results are shown in figure 4.1. Explain the results um, that they've found. So this isn't, I basically have about four or five specs that I'm choosing questions from. So this could be basically anything from AQA, OCR, um, edXLA, edXLB. Um, what else do I use? I use the WJEC one. I use, uh, there's a couple more, which I honestly can't remember the names of, but genuinely like all these questions are ones that are relevant to everyone. Like everyone really needs to know about enzymes. You're not getting away from enzymes, if that helps. <laughs> I can't tell you what's, where it is in the spec specifically, because I don't know, but it's near the front. Anyway, um, how could we explain these results? That, I'm gonna get rid of my face. <laughs> How can you explain these results? As concentration increases, the initial rate increases. Yes, why? Good, increase collisions, increase enzyme substrate complexes. Eventually after all four, after four levels, the enzyme active sites are all occupied nice. So the substrate becomes a limiting factor. Really, really good bowl of rice. I find it weird to be calling you bowl of rice, but I like it. Uh, more enzyme substrate complexes. Um, the initial rate of reaction increases, eventually a plateau as the enzyme gets saturated. Yes, that will ultimately happen, the active site specifically though. Initial rate of reaction increases because the proportion of successful collisions is increased, very good. So more ESCs, good. Yeah, this is really good guys, well done. So I think it would be worth sort of separating this graph into two sections, right? And this is what I tend to do with any graph question, unless it actually asks you to uh, specifically use a graph at some point, I would be more than happy to see someone do like A and B, right? So, and go on, let's put a C at the end. So between A and B, so between A and B, we want to say something about um, the rate increasing. So rate is increasing as substrate increases, and that won't get you a mark, unfortunately, but we're getting there. And then we can say as uh, there are more successful collisions. That would be the first mark. Okay, we can say something like um, more enzyme substrate complexes form. Okay, so we could say there'd be more of those. Um, what else could we say? Oh, you could get, apparently on this question, you can get a mark for using some data somewhere. So you could say 
um, that maybe at one, whoops, at one we're hitting 40 as a rate, whereas at three maybe we're hitting just below 70, so it's hitting 68. So basically for the third mark, use some data. Okay, and then we, we want to start talking about what's happening between B and C. So at B and C, what is happening for this line? Can you actually letter the areas on the graph? Yeah, yeah, of course you can. Yeah, if, if you, like an examiner's are gonna be smart enough if they're gonna see what you're doing in terms of like adding a little annotation. So yeah, I'd be fine with doing that. So what are we saying then? All, all the active sites are filled, good. So between B and C, uh, every active site is filled. Is there another word for that that you know? Oh, Alex, you got there very quickly. Every active site is filled, which means it's saturated. So it's gonna plateau. Um, you can say something like, I don't know, that actually gets you a mark actually using that word, strangely. So it plateaus. I would not normally give a mark for that. So every active site is filled, it's saturated. And we could say the rate can no longer increase. As substrate concentration, or you could say casical, whatever it is. Um, whoops. Concentration is the limiting factor. Substration. Whoops. I think I just combined substrate and concentration in my head. Um, as substrate concentration is limiting the rate. Well done for not mentioning um, kinetic energy and stuff there, by the way. So why is the substrate limiting? Because at this point here, basically between B and C, it doesn't matter how much more you increase the concentration, the rate isn't changing, which means that it's the limiting factor at this point. In fact, no, it means the enzymes are, doesn't it? Sorry, I'm talking nonsense. So it doesn't matter how much I increase my um, substrates, it's the enzymes that are now limiting it because they're, all the active sites are filled. Sorry, well done for noticing that. You are totally right. Yeah, to Jasa, sorry, my bad. So the rate is constant, <laughs> no worries. Um, it's the kind of thing, isn't it, where I think if you, until you properly look at it, it wasn't until I looked at what the uh, unit of a graph was, I was like, oh yeah, no, I'm being stupid. Uh, cool, awesome. Um, apparently as well, for those of you that cover VMAX in your uh, spec, you could start talking that the VMAX, which basically just means the fastest that the rate can really get, you can say that that's occurring at about a concentration of five um, millimolar, or whatever that is, micromolar. So you could say that there, it's, it's millimolar, not micro. Okay, so that's something that you can say. Um, a student investigated the breakdown of starch into maltose. The results are shown in figure 2.1. Calculate the rate of maltose production over the first 30 seconds. If you can see this, um, what would you say? If you can read this well enough. It was many miles. So yeah, how can we work out the rate of maltose production? Draw a tangent. Um, you could be drawing a tangent. Yep. So you could be looking at your 30 seconds. So to get to 30 seconds, they've actually done it a little bit for you, right? So the time is in minutes. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. So I need to be going two and a half along to get to 30 seconds. Very conveniently for us, there is a point there. So it's actually very straightforward. So if we're looking at um, the maltose concentration, then I know that in 30 seconds, the maltose concentration has gone from zero up to we need to work out the gap. So it looks like there's 10 squares, but I don't know. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So 20 over 10 means each little square is worth two. So that's at 16, if I'm not mistaken. 
So I've got 16 m mol in 30 seconds. Okay, so how could you turn that into a rate then? So this question is actually quite nice. You can do it in quite a few ways. So because they're saying you can choose what units you want, then you can either do um, how many it's going to be in m mole. Um, you could go for minutes minus one, or you could go for m mole second minus one. Okay, it doesn't really matter too much. I would tend to try and stick with SI units as best as I could. So I would probably go for that one. Um, so the way you can do this then is if I know that it's been 16 in 30 seconds and I want to work out what one second is, then you're going to divide both of them by 30. Okay, so if you do that, 16 over 30 equals... So you don't really have to draw a tangent with this one. Um, I could have drawn my tangent coming down here if I wanted to, but it's, it's the same thing, right? There is my tangent. So 16 over 30 is going to be what? Um, because they're giving me the choice. So it says use appropriate units, calculate the rate of maltose production. Because it's a rate, I can choose what my unit is really if they're allowing me to use appropriate units. So I end up getting 0.53. M mole second minus one. Okay, you need that little minus, or if you don't do the minus, you can do a dash. It makes literally no difference. So you could do that. Um, or if I wanted to, I could write 0 0.53 M mole um, second minus one. Or if I wanted to, I could do it per minute, in which case I'd double it to 32 M mole um, per minute or I could do it with a minus one. Okay, so it's totally up to you. It's your choice here. Um, I would personally go for per second because that makes more sense to me to do it, but they are crediting you if you do it um, per minute as well. So essentially all I'm saying here is uh, if you've worked out what it is, so it's 16 uh, millimoles in 30 seconds, I need to work out a rate, which I need to therefore choose an arbitrary number to divide it by. So you, we tend to use per second in science Sometimes you use per minute, but we tend to use per second. So essentially, I just decided to do um, 16 divided by 30, which gives me the value of 0 0.53. Is that all right? Oh, sorry, that's because I wasn't actually, yeah, no, you're right. Um, this, I, I was stuck on what we were that one maybe i don't know no you're right so it's, it's m mole dm minus three you are totally right that is me being um a sausage so it should be 0 0.53 m mole dm minus three s minus one or you could go for 32 m mole minute oh, no i messed up again damn dm minus three minute minus one yeah. So yeah, this minus one thing, if you've never, if you've never come across that, minus one just means divided by. So basically, as opposed to writing it like this, I could do as opposed to minus three, I could leave that as cubed and do m mole dash decimeter, get rid of a one dash second, but it just looks a bit messy. So scientists prefer to do a minus because it shows that you're dividing it. That's all it is. 16 came from looking at the graph. So I was looking at 0 0.3, sorry, uh, half a minute. So I followed up the line. And then when you follow it across, you get to 16. So how would this calculated rate differ from the true initial rate of reaction? So if you measure it after 30 seconds, how would that differ to the actual rate of reaction? So this is two marks. Because I was doing it per minute. or per second, your choice, Arbab. So yeah, how would how would this differ from the actual initial rate of reaction? Is the initial rate of reaction faster or slower than this? And why? Don't apologize. Don't apologize at all, it's fine. 
Good. The uh, the true initial rate is faster. Why? Why would it be faster? I did draw a tangent. There's a little triangle there. High concentration of what, Miriam? Why, is the, why does the rate slow down? Why is it fastest at the start? It's not limited by maltose concentration. Excellent, yeah, that's exactly right. So essentially, um, the actual initial rate of reaction, if you could measure it at 0.0000001 seconds, or basically zero seconds, um, it would be as fast as it can get, because this is when the number of substrates is at its greatest concentration. So the true rate is faster um, because there is a higher substrate concentration, which means more enzyme substrate complexes. I'm only writing this out just so you know not to be lazy. Okay. <laughs> can you go to the toilet real quick? Oliver, you don't have to ask. You can just go to the toilet if you want. That's fine. Okay, uh, lovely. Right, next question then. So what we got? Figure 1.1 figure shows the effect of increasing the substrate concentration on the rate of activity of pepsin, which is a, an enzyme that breaks down proteins or hydrolyzes pepsin. Pepstatin is a competitive inhibitor of pepsin. On figure 1.1, draw a line to represent the effect of adding a fixed concentration of pepstatin on the rate of pepsin activity over the whole range of substrate concentrations. Can you just describe it what you're doing? I know that you can't physically do this before anyone says. <laughs> yes, you are not in school. You might have noticed you're not in school by your surroundings, which are probably your house. Good, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, it's gonna be below, it's basically gonna get to the same point. So the mistake people make is they would sort of finish it off somewhere over here, right? Uh, it's got to get to the same point eventually. So because it's a competitive inhibitor, it is only temporarily binding. So it will get to the same place eventually. It's just going to take a bit longer and the gradient is going to be less steep. Ooh, didn't mean that. I suck at drawing lines on this with my pen. There you go. Something like that would be fine. So it's going to get to the same stage eventually. It just needs to ultimately get, um, get there slower. So basically what it says is the same start. So the mark scheme says the start and the end position are the same. However, the rate is slower um, or it doesn't really peak so much or it doesn't really begin to plateau. So the one that you draw probably won't plateau because this one only just seems to be plateauing. So if there's an inhibitor, it probably won't get to that. So yeah, it probably won't. Uh, no, because it's going to reach the same rate eventually. It's just going to be slower to get there. So if you continuously increase your substrate concentration, the rate will eventually get to the highest point kind of thing. So pepstatin acts as a competitive inhibitor. What could you conclude about the structure of pepstatin? Yeah, I know, right? I'm getting thirsty for pepstatin too. Complementary shape to the active site, very good. Cool. And therefore, yeah, complementary shape to the active um, site. Therefore, it has a similar shape as well. To whatever it was called, pepsin. No, not pepsin. What did it say it breaks down? I don't know. It doesn't say the substrate. Similar shape to the substrate. But yeah, so two marks. So it's going to be complementary and it also is therefore going to have quite a similar shape to the substrate. It won't be exactly the same. Um, what could I include about structure? Yeah, if you wanted to sort of when in doubt mention tertiary structure. So maybe the tertiary structure means, and then basically write that. So the tertiary structure means it's got, in fact, no, we don't know that it's a protein actually, because pepstatin is just some molecule, we can't say tertiary structure because we don't know. We don't know if it's a protein, so we can't say that. Um, sorry. Yeah. 
pepsin breaks down proteins to amino acids you are totally right uh okay this is a bit of a weird question this seems like one of the easiest questions i think any a level has ever thrown at anyone um as heat is increased basically tell me better words to replace these with so as the heat increased the reaction went faster until it got to its highest after this the rate of reaction fell this happened because the enzyme was killed and the hydrogen peroxide could not fit into the uh, enzyme's key site so yes heat they mean temperature. They could feasibly mean kinetic energy as well. Uh, highest should be optimum. Yes. Killed, denatured. And active. Can you imagine that as an exam for four marks? What is that like? Is it, is it 92? I guess it's not many when you say that. In a paper, four out of 92, that's like almost 4% of your exam for that, or over 4% of your exam for that. Ridiculous. Uh, okay, here's a question about sauerkraut, because why not? So scurvy is caused by vitamin C deficiency and used to be a serious concern for sailors. Uh, these sailors had no access to fresh fruit and vegetables during long sea voyages. Sauerkraut, fermented cabbage, contains vitamin C. Ship stored uh, sauerkraut because it does not decompose easily. Fun fact for you, uh, during the Second World War, America decided that they'd no longer call it sauerkraut and decided they called it, uh, call it, I think, freedom cabbage, freedom cabbage, uh, I think that was it, freedom cabbage as opposed to sauerkraut because it sounded too German. But anyway, uh, it does not decompose easily. Vitamin C is water soluble and is found in cabbage cells. These cells also contain an enzyme, ascorbic acid oxidase, that can oxidize vitamin C. Table below shows the vitamin C content of sauerkraut and cabbage treated in different ways. So uh, calculate the percentage loss of vitamin C when what can't speak when raw cabbage was added to cold water and then boiled for five minutes. Um, I think this could be. I don't. I, I have no idea what this example is. This is relevant to everyone. No one could not expect this. <laughs> so how do we do this what example does this question i honestly couldn't say i use about five or six different sources of questions and i only choose questions which are basically relevant to most people so this could be the same for anyone how are we working this out guys what is the calculation i don't want to see at least x no, but, well, yeah, I see what you mean. The last question feasibly might not have looked like something you could have had, but it's still a relevant thing. Like, uh, yeah, Anissa, I'll just start all again, yeah? Excellent, guys. I'm glad to see you guys know what you're doing. So um, to work out percentage change, this is a classic A-level question, which you'll constantly be asked all of the time. Um, work out the difference. So raw cabbage, 32.2, and cold water and boiled, cold water and boiled. So 32.2 minus 7.6, which I'm not going to even try and do in my head because why would I? Equals 24.6 divided by the initial number, which was 32.2 times 100. Equals a reduction by 76.4%. Okay, so that's how you do it. So you work out the difference, dividing by whatever the original thing was. So in this case, it was 32.2. Okay, so yeah, I would expect this question a lot. I would also um, basically make sure that you can do questions like this because pretty much any form of maths test that you'll ever get asked to do in your life, like if you ever apply for a job and they get you to do a maths test, they will have a question like this on there. So make sure you can do this. Just standard, standard life skill that. Don't know why. Um, so suggest why the vitamin C content is reduced by boiling the cabbage in water. You could do a minus sign in front if you want to. It wasn't in the mark scheme, but yeah, you are right. Suggest why the vitamin C, could it only ask you for what the percentage difference was? So it doesn't really matter, but you are right. So boiling water, what is it going to do?
Denatures enzymes. What enzymes? What enzymes are you on about? What does ascorbic acid have to do with it? That causes it to oxidize more, no? Good. So it's doing something to the cell wall. It is not, in fact, it's not doing anything to the cell wall. It's doing something to the membrane. So by boiling the cabbage, why would you assume that that's going to uh, break down any enzyme? I, I know that's what we naturally tend to do, but it says vitamin C is bro broken down by an enzyme. So if anything, that enzyme's still working, right? No. So just why the vitamin C um, content is being reduced is because heat breaks cell membranes. It causes all the phospholipids to start moving like crazy. Um, kinetic energy will basically cause it to reduce. So that means that essentially, well, what's going to happen? So cell membrane will be hydrolyzed. What else does it say about vitamin C? It definitely says something in her, which is important. Good, it's soluble. It says it's soluble right here. So if it's soluble, what's it going to do? You're boiling it in water. Yeah, it's going to dissolve. Cell membrane hydrolyzed. Um, vitamin C will dissolve in water. Oh dear. Nice. Scurvy's fun. If you ever want to look up some gross pictures, look up some people with scurvy. Um, Suggest so why less vitamin C is lost when a cabbage is added to boiling water rather than cold water and then being boiled for five minutes. So why is it the case if I add it to cold water first, that reduces it more than if I um, just add it to boiling water? Not affecting more potential, good guess. Well, I think this is the last question as well. Nope, large change temperature doesn't do much. What is something that you haven't mentioned in any of these answers yet, which is mentioned in this like, block of information? Climatization. No, cabbage does not acclimatize, unfortunately. Water has a latent heat. Nope. Mm. Miriam, your closest. Cold water decreases permeability. Nope. Yes, the enzyme. Something about this enzyme. What's the enzyme doing it if, if you put it in cold water compared to what happens to the enzyme if you put it in hot water? <laughs> yeah, uh, Miss Emi, you are right. So if you put it in boiling water, so it says vitamin C is water soluble and found in cabbage, the cells also contain an enzyme, ascorbic acid oxidase, that oxidizes vitamin C. If vitamin C gets oxidized, is it still vitamin C? No, it's something different, right? So if this enzyme is active, then it is basically doing something. It's reacting vitamin C, changing it. So if you put it in cold water, is that enzyme still going to work? Compared to boiling water. Yeah, so boiling water denatures whatever it's called, uh, ascorbic acid oxidase and therefore it cannot um, oxidize vitamin C. Right, so that's weird, isn't it? She would have thought that if you add it to cold water first, that would probably be good in maintaining the amount of vitamin C, but it's actually a bad thing, it seems. Who knew? Okay, so that is your answer that you can really get here. Um, by putting it in cold water, you're basically making it worse for you. So why can't we talk about enzymes in the last question? In this question, because th there's no reason why enzymes are going to cause the vitamin C to be lost, I guess. Oh, right. Are you saying, suggest why vitamin C is reduced? Are you saying, hang on, um, Symphuja, you might be right here. If you said that uh, heat 
denatures whatever it's called ascorbic acid oxidase preventing oxidation you could actually get a mark for that as well so if you said something along those lines um you could get the mark so suggest why vitamin c content oh no that doesn't make sense yeah no that just makes sense at all does it so um by boiling it you're denaturing this which is going to maintain the amount of uh, vitamin c so no sorry i take that back i'm wrong which happens a lot okay so no this one the reason that you're losing vitamin c is because you're heating it up um i imagine lots of you have probably done an experiment in your life where you get some beetroot and you put it in different concentrations of alcohol or you put it in different temperatures of water um and essentially what happens is all the pigment called betalin starts to leak out right the reason for that is because the cell membrane has been um basically hydrolyzed it's starting to break down i, th I think you probably could use the word break down as opposed to hydrolyze here so it falls apart there's so much kinetic energy it just splits up right yes yeah, required practical for lots of you so oxidase is just the enzyme um in fact uh, so yeah that's that's the reason why you reduce vitamin c because it basically starts to fall apart the second question is just saying why does adding water have an effect oh, sorry why does cold water mean that you lose more uh, vitamin c than just boiling it it's because if you boil it you're getting rid of this enzyme which sole purpose is to basically alter vitamin c in some way so the reason that boiling water is sorry the cold water is bad for cabbage which sounds weird is because when you add cold water um you are basically allowing this enzyme to carry on functioning and if that enzyme is used to oxidize vitamin c then that's bad news for the amount of vitamin c that you're going to have <clears throat> so are phospholipids and cell membranes connect together by bonds yeah that's why i said hydrolyze might not necessarily be the best word you could feasibly hydrolyze um the um, the fatty acids and the glycerol but you're right i probably just mean that they move apart so the cell membrane i could probably change this uh to damaged and that would probably make more biological sense because they're moving apart because basically there's so much energy i guess the bonds that exist are like van der Waals or london forces but essentially the more heat there is the more likely they are to break right i need to talk to you guys about snap revise so for those of you who have hopefully enjoyed today's session and you're thinking, oh, how could I possibly have more biology lessons um, so that I can do as well as I feasibly could at this time of crisis when I'm stuck at home? Hmm. I have an answer for you, which is Snap Revise. So for those of you that have liked it, essentially what my company like to do is um, we have this whole website where essentially you can get various different things. So I do lots of web classes. So tomorrow, for instance, I'm going to be doing some enzyme stuff, which is a weird coincidence. Um, but look, I'm going over some gas exchange on uh, Monday, going over food tests on Tuesday, stem cells, transcription factors, body plans, d DNA and RNA, various things, right? So essentially, I do these web classes every single day, and I'm doing quite a lot of them at the moment, quite considerably more of them than I was doing a few weeks ago, because now everyone's at home. Um, we sort of upped the number. I also do little drop-in sessions where you guys can ask me questions. And look, look at this. Uh, in fact, I haven't actually filled these in very well, but I'm, I've got lots of them um, pretty much every day apart from Friday at the moment. So that's most, well, that's some of what Snap provides is. On top of that, we also have sort of some more basic features, uh, such as every single topic in A-level biology. Uh, let's look at transpiration and xylem and whatnot. And essentially what happens, apart from this guy trying to talk to you, is when you go onto our website, um, you'll get given a quiz. I'll show you what the quiz looks like. Bam, got that right. It's like not even reading it. You have, oh God, it's really long. Basically, when you've done the quiz, if I keep doing it, it will come up with the things that you clearly know and the things that you clearly do not know. So it's based specifically on your specification, which is cool. <sighs> and yeah, it will tell you that perhaps you don't know very much about how the xylem works, or you don't know very much about cohesion tension, or you don't know very much about hydrogen bonds, or you don't know very much about osmotic pressure, or you don't know very much about whatever. And oh, finally, look, there you go. Here's what I did know, here's what I didn't know, right? And following this, it will basically come up with a load of videos, which will basically go over the things that you clearly do not know. So after you've done that, 
You can then do another little quiz. So there's like a little quizzy thing here, which you could have a go at doing just to test yourself. Um, after 15 questions, if you were still not feeling like you'd got it enough, there are some more exam questions that someone will go through with you. There you go, someone's going through an exam question. Uh, we also have exam packs as part of this as well. So however many questions, there you go, look at all that. I literally chose this randomly and it comes up with an ideal solution to this problem. And if all of that's still not enough for you to feel confident, we then also have a revision guide, which you could basically set at home with if it ever loads up. There you go. Um, and it will basically go over things that you should also know. It kind of looks a bit like those books, which I'm sure lots of you already have anyway, but uh, it will be very specific to your specification, right? So there's loads of different things you have. Um, and on top of that as well, for the best package that we offer, um, there's also the ability for you to ask questions, right? So for instance, this person has asked a question and then boom, look, here is my answer to her question. So that's essentially what Snap provides is for any of you who are remotely interested, uh, I'm obviously biased, but it is genuinely really good. If you are feeling like you are falling behind a bit or if you need a bit of a teacher because your teachers are at home and you're at home and your parents don't know how to teach A-level biology and they're probably working from home, then this is probably, well, not probably, this is a one solution which could hopefully be really helpful. And if you're totally not convinced, which is fine, um, then we've got loads of other live videos coming up in the near future. So we don't have any on Friday um, and I'm not doing one on Tuesday next week because I'm doing a big seminar thing, um, which is also going to be online, but not on YouTube. Um, but yeah, if you, if you genuinely don't think we're very good, then that's fine. But if you want to still do some work, then check out our videos. If you really hate it, then don't. But check out the videos that we're doing for free. And if, if at the end you feel like this is something that could really help you, then uh, by all means, sign up. Um, apart from that, here is a £10 off voucher for anyone who wants it, which will run out tonight. Um, but otherwise, I think that's pretty much it. So <laughs> if, any of you, if any of you have any questions, I'll sit around for a bit and try and answer any questions and I'll look at what you're saying. But yeah, otherwise, have a really, really lovely um, afternoon, guys. Do you have an NHS discount? Do you work for the NHS? Right. What are we saying? What are we saying? What are we saying? Thank you. Um, no worries. £10 off biology only. I doubt it. I reckon you could use this code for pretty much any of the specs. I think that'd be, that'd be fine. Don't call me, sir. My name's Ollie. No, your mum does. Ah, in which case I have no idea. Um, do we cover WJEC specifically? No, we don't cover them specifically, but I guess there are probably lots of things that overlap. But Georgina, yeah, sorry about that. Thank you for the class. No worries. Um, what else? What else are you saying? Random question, is it common for sick forms to not do AS levels? Yes, most places don't do AS levels anymore. Uh, next biology session is, what day is it today? Wednesday. I'm not doing one on Friday um, because I'm basically working at the, on Sunday. So my, my boss let me have that off. Um, and then I'm not doing one on Monday. So the next one will be this time next week, actually, won't it? Um, what else are you saying? Thank you for helping, no worries, no worries. <laughs> awesome. Do I have a Nando? Yeah, you do have a discount, uh, a Nando's discount. That is very true at the moment, which I don't have. Can you answer this? Give free advantages of conserving plant species as seeds and not as adult plants. Storage is easier, I'd say. Um, take up less room. It's probably quite good. They need less things. They don't need water in. They don't need carbon dioxide as much. They sort of just can live. Don't know. Uh, yeah. Probably those things. Will the code still work if you resubscribe to Snap Revise? Master Gamer, I reckon if it doesn't, if you emailed support at Snap Revise, which I'm pretty sure my man who is behind a laptop somewhere, um, I'm sure I'll send you a link. If it doesn't work, then send them an email and I'm sure they'll sort it out for you because that seems like a silly thing to ignore. Unless you're literally like signing up every day and then <laughs> choosing to then sort of not be a part of it and then going back. My name is quite memorable. Hope you remember my name next time I join. Miss Emi, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> I should be the boss. Now there's a, there's a suggestion, Afif. Yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe I should be the boss. I'll uh, relay that on and see what um, my boss does say. Can we get corrections for proteins? I don't know what you mean. What does Duracell replace T with an mRNA? Why does it? That is a good question, 
Aaron. I don't know why it does. It just does. Don't know. How's the Sunday seminar going to work? Um, so it will essentially be as if you had gone to Imperial University, uh, Imperial College even, and you'll get sent a link essentially, and you'll be sent a booklet, hopefully in the next few days. And um, basically we'll just sit here and go through it. So I, I was planning to be doing it in London, but I'm not really allowed to leave my house as you guys would know. So I'm gonna be sat here and I'm just gonna go through a whole load of biology is how it's gonna work. What do you mean is there any way of getting corrections? What's wrong? Uh, how's it work? Yeah, it's a subscription program. So you pay like um, however much it is per month. So I think the cheapest one, I don't want to actually say, I'm sure my man behind the computer can send you a link as well. I think the most expensive one is like, I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. But yeah, you pay X amount per month, right? And I think the comparison that you've got to consider is... I used to be a tutor for a bit. So I used to work as a teacher for about four years. Before that, I was at uni, I used to tutor people in maths, which is a bit weird because I've only got a GCC in it, but it doesn't matter. Um, I used to charge about 40 quid a session and it's considerably cheaper than that when you consider that uh, you'll be getting like, I don't know, how many how many would you get per month? Per week, you'd be getting at least, at least 12 sessions a week, so 12 hours of my time a week, so 24, 48, you're getting almost 50 hours a week, basically. So it basically comes down to about a quid per session. <laughs> so I guess that's how I'd compare it, but it's, it's up to you. Is it the same tutor? Yes, Marios, I am the person, I am the head of biology, so I, I do stuff. How does a man behind the computer work? Does, does it actually read? <laughs> yeah, um, the thing that says Snap provides is, is actually our uh, intelligent AI system um, named Jayco, who can just basically do anything. So if, if you ask for a link to something, um, then Jayco will send it. How would you know if the question wants you to know about enzymes or cell membranes? Um, because if enzymes aren't necessarily involved, then it can't be enzymes, right? If you're talking about something leaking from a membrane, it's probably the, sorry, leaking from a cell, it's probably the membrane. <laughs> I hope he's still here. I'm really sad if he is no longer here. He's probably getting upset with me that I'm talking about him. He likes to hide. There we go. There he is. <laughs> yeah, he is. He is basically the best part of Snap Revise in my mind. But anyway, I'm going to go. Have a lovely evening, guys. <laughs> yeah, more more so than any of the teaching or anything else. My man behind the keyboard. <laughs> there you go. We're not a couple before you ask. See you later, guys. <laughs> Bye.